Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with What's the Future Health. We are talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we have got another CEO from another company that is going public via a SPAC. So everybody, please meet the founder and CEO of Kano Health, which will be going public here soon with a SPAC merger with Jaws Acquisition Corp, which is Barry Sternlich of like Starwood fame's SPAC. Um, we're going to dive into the details about that. But before we do, please meet Marlo Hernandez. And let's jump in right away, Marlo. Tell everybody about your business. You guys are doing Primary Care Plus for the Medicare market, particularly focused on the underserved markets. You got your start working with the Latino population in South Florida, and look at you now. So tell us about the business. That's right. Now, we're incredibly excited, and we've been so fortunate over 10 years to help so many people. So, yeah, we're a uh, medical center operator that uh, focuses on the underserved community. More specifically, we're a population health management company delivering on increasing quality, decreasing costs with a great patient experience across our medical centers, but also to our affiliates. We provide a number of ancillary services and hence focus on building a population health platform so that we can be a solution that can sustainably increase healthcare while controlling those healthcare costs that um, frankly impoverish so many communities, prevent folks from uh, working, uh, from climbing the, the social ladders. Uh, it's an issue in our country and uh, we are very proud to be part of that solution. We have been very fortunate uh, to get our start in very competitive South Florida, but today we operate in Florida, in Puerto Rico, in Texas, and Nevada, and soon we'll be in other states. And uh, we're very excited uh, about continuing to uh, bring about our clinical outcomes, which in our model of care is tied to our financial outcomes. So okay, uh, like most stop right there, stop right there, stop right there. Let's unpack some of this piece by piece because you said yeah. so much that I wanna come back to. And let's just start though with the last thing you said, because we're yeah. going to go into those financial outcomes for a second first. Then we'll talk about the health outcomes, and then we'll we'll come back around on some of this um, sure. taking care of the underserved population. All right. So let's talk about those financial outcomes because this is incredibly impressive. I mean, you guys have been um, listed within Inc. Magazine's top 5,000 privately owned companies among the fastest growing in 2019, number six. Last year, 2020 pandemic year, number 39, I believe, isn't that right? 7,000% growth rate over the past three years. So talk a little bit about this and explain to us what's driving your tremendous growth. Well, um, as opposed to uh, most of the country and, and most healthcare uh, businesses, patients are a monetizing event. And of course, most doctors don't see it that way, certainly not most nurses or other healthcare personnel, but you go when you're sick. Um, you have a, a problem, it's episodic care, it's transactional, they'll charge you for it. In our model of care, the healthier you are, the better we do. So we do not get paid on fee for service. 96% value -based care. of revenue is value-based care. We get a capitated fee whereby we're incentivized to invest in the necessary technology and resources to keep you healthy. So we engage more, four times more on average than what you typically get on the fee-for-service system. We have more services, we have more access sites, and as a result, we do better financially because probably no uh, secret when healthcare is working, when you don't have an obstruction or a disincentive to come get healthcare, you tell your friends and your family about it. And we've come from effectively uh, two clinics uh, five years ago to over 70 today. And uh, really it's because patients keep telling their friends and family about our services. Providers flock to us and so do payers because we increase quality while decreasing those costs and making the healthcare system more efficient. All right, talk to me about some of those payer relationships, because one of the things that struck me when I breezed through the investor deck is the partnership with Humana. And so talk to me about Humana. You guys, I mean, in Florida, this is their biggest uh, Medicare Advantage market. What do you got to say about that? 
Humana, great company, great uh, infrastructure, great people, a lot of respect. Been working with them for many years. Um, we're also working with them in other parts of the country. So in uh, all four of our main states and, and territories, uh, we have strategic relationships uh, with them. And we work with other payers as well, of course, United, Anthem, Edna, CVS, etc. cetera. Uh, but Humana can say enough uh, good things. They've had it right for so long. They've been a pioneer in value-based care from the payer standpoint, but it's a matter of having enough providers in order to actually take care of the patients. And today, if you put candle-like companies together, you don't get to 10% of the population. So even if you've got a great payer like Humana, the problem is not how you actually uh, do the financial components, the actuarial work, the bidding, the plans, all of that. The problem is who is actually providing the care and who's able to work under this value-based care arrangement, provide all these additional services. And right now, 90% of the service is done under fee-for-service, you know, the more intimate and, and limited primary care and other establishments, which do not produce the outcomes that we see in value-based care. All right, do you guys have your own physicians then? Are you, are you everybody is everybody who's delivering care for Cano is is a Cano uh, a doc? Is that right, or is it? Are you guys contracting out in any way? Right. So uh, for primary care in all of our centers, it's salaried physicians with quality bonus, and those quality bonuses again are based on patient outcomes right. rather than just how many patients and procedures you did, uh, which is still pretty much the norm. Um, we also serve uh, 500 plus affiliates um, in our markets. So not in our medical centers where we have 200 plus providers, we have 500 plus uh, affiliates or PCPs, primary care physicians, uh, that uh, don't have the technology, don't have the contracting, but want to be uh, in value-based care and need that critical partner to take the financial risk uh, to contract uh, not only with the payers for such risk, but also to help them manage the patients and, and build uh, networks. And as far as third party services go, we contract with specialists in a broad way to hospitals. We only do primary care, uh, but we certainly work with the health plans, work with our affiliates in order to have the best performing networks available so that they can provide top-notch care for their patients. All right, Marla, tell me too about the population health uh, platform that you've built, because this took me a little bit by surprise. I'm not going to lie. I like I, I dive into the into the investor deck and I'm looking around and I expected it just to be all about clinics and scaling up value-based uh, Medicare Advantage you know, care. I expected that. Instead, I find this whole little nugget in there about this population health software that you guys like designed, developed, built, and that some of those affiliates are using, right, to run their practices. So say a little bit more about this. Tell us what this is and like what the plan is for scaling this out. Right. So from inception, we were self-funded. So it was uh, a dream um, to build this comprehensive one-stop shop medical center. But then comes the reality of how do you make it efficient enough uh, within a uh, limited funding uh, to provide more services, which um, runs counter to how healthcare works. In order to have the funding to provide more services, you generally have to bill for them. And so we had to build for our own purposes, different you know, components that were necessary in order to make it efficient, scalable, portable, et cetera. And so it developed over time, uh, over uh, a five year uh, period in which we reinvested many of the profits uh, we made, and we've always been a self-funded company still to this day. Um, we grow organically in a self-funded uh, way. We take a lot of pride uh, in that. Uh, we've never had a single month of uh, deficits uh, in our business, but then again, by necessity. Either it was uh, profitable and it worked and we can grow, or we couldn't. Uh, and um, now we're very fortunate um, in that uh, we've got, you know, obviously great access to capital and we can further accelerate our historical uh, growth. Uh, but we built that uh, platform because we needed to become more efficient and it wasn't out there, Jessica. Uh, the um, one-stop shop solution that we were trying to provide patients from an operating perspective didn't have a technical solution uh, for us to actually have the infrastructure to do it. And so uh, the EHRs 
we have some off the shelf that we would take, but could not do many of the services that we wanted to do. And it wasn't bridged to a care management module or a transportation module or a, a credentialing or a referrals or an analytics. And so Panorama today is over 20 modules is what we call our population health platform. Yeah, Panorama. Panorama. Uh, and we have 350 plus unique reports and thousands of bridges and algorithm templates and, and so forth um, that all work in concert in the back end uh, to improve care. So you've got providers typing into it. You've got healthcare administrative staff. You've got offsite care managers. They're all typing into their own modules, but it's informing care throughout the organization so that we're creating personalized health plans for each of our patients and the outputs is what you can see in terms of our APTs or admitted, uh, admissions per thousand or mortality rates uh, or, or GDR or many other metrics that we look into in order to ensure that we are actually providing measurably better care. All right, speaking of that better care, give me like a couple of the, the, the favorite uh, healthcare outcomes numbers that you love, like give me three or four of, of your favorite stats you love to talk about in terms of demonstrating how good the quality of care is at Kano Health. Sure, um, and I could point to clinical outcomes. Um, like <laughs> We, we can look at like A1C rates and how we do with our patients with, di with diabetes. Uh, we, we can look at our readmission uh, rates and what we can do that specifically for disease states like COPD and we've published uh, our data uh, in the past. And you can also look at the financial components, how over time that the, the longer a patient is with us, uh, the healthier they are and so the less they have to spend in order to maintain or improve their health. And we can see that it's almost linear from the time they joined Cano uh, to uh, three plus years with uh, the company. But the one that I'm by far most proud of, Jessica, is our mortality rate. Okay. From my understanding, we're the only company that publishes and has published that kind of data uh, going back three plus uh, years. And we've had a 60 plus percent mortality reduction this year, uh, 2020 with COVID. COVID, our third leading cause of death in this country, very, very sad how many patients have lost their lives. And we ourselves have had, of course, patients lose their lives due to COVID-19. Yet 40 plus percent reduction compared to the year before. So once wow. the country updates its mortality statistics, because we've published 2020 data mortality versus the country pre-COVID, uh, and it's still 40 plus percent better, uh, it's probably going to be 70 plus percent better. We've also published American Journal of Managed Care, our COVID-19 outcomes backed by Cleveland Clinic uh, in Florida, by HCA, uh, by um, NOAA Southeastern researchers for these uh, different institutions with a peer-reviewed article showing a 60 percent lower mortality for COVID patients. So we have a lower overall mortality. We have a lower COVID-specific mortality. You can see improved outcome by disease state. But, you know, on everything, if I mention like HEDIS scores and different quality metrics, um, they could be subjective. They may or may not be completely associated with clinical outcomes. But one that is a hard and fast statistic that never lies is how long do your patients live? And that value prop of telling our patients, John, join Cano, not only because you have a better quality of life, but you will live statistically longer. Uh, that is part of what drives me every day to continue to innovate and reach that one more patient that needs me. No, that's fantastic. Providing uh, longer lives, better, healthier lives for seniors. That's amazing. And especially when longevity is, I think, a key concern for all of us. <laughs> um, I want to ask a little bit about the, um, I want to talk a little bit now about, about JAWS Acquisition Corp. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, can you tell us when are you guys going to start trading under your own ticker? Is that coming up here? I, I know it's imminent, but can you tease us a little bit and give us an idea of the timing? When is the, when is the ticker going to change from the JAWS Acquisition Corp ticker to the C-A-N-O that you'll be trading under? <laughs> Soon. Um, and uh, we um, uh, believe that uh, it will be in the next few weeks, but of course, going through the SEC uh, process uh, and they've been you know quite yeah. busy so I'm very empathetic uh, and um, the short answer is uh, soon so um, stay tuned. okay so Q2 ish ish we're, we're right here uh, no definitely definitely okay. Q2. all right definitely Q2 and then tell me about the tell me about Jaws 
like this, like I said at the top, I'm like, I was really surprised to see Barry Sternlich and Starwood, you know, pop up in healthcare. I mean, that, I'm like, you know, just the same way I'm also surprised to see, you know, there's celebrity investors pop into our space. And so tell me a little bit about this relationship and, and, and working with, with him and with the JAWS team. I mean, what are they bringing to Kano? Because, I mean, this is obviously a, a, a partnership that's going to endure just, you know, past the, the um, acquisition to bring you guys public. So tell me a little bit about them. Well, we're very fortunate to have uh, an incredible board. We've announced our PubCo uh, board um, in which you've got um, eight out of nine uh, minorities, uh, two women, uh, three Fortune uh, 500 uh, CEOs, um, great uh, physician uh, leaders, but also tech uh, leaders like a Jackie Gillishar and uh, great uh, legal experts um, like a Kim Rivera. And Barry, um, like uh, Sol here and many others that we have on our board, Lou Gold, Elliot Cooperstone, uh, Angel Morales. Yeah, Barry's a visionary and um, he wanted to invest in a company that first that was doing a, a social good that he believed in, uh, that was doing well by doing good. Um, two, that was uh, necessary, um, th that wasn't you know, discretionary or, or a, a like or, or a want, it was a must have, you, you must have primary care. Um, three that had um, a huge TAM um, and um, had um, four uh, recurring uh, revenues. So an all weather company with a huge TAM that was uh, a necessity uh, to the marketplace uh, that did well by doing good. And uh, he, um, not only um, uh, and very publicly uh, invested in our company outside of what is his traditional domain of real estate by making the best in, uh, or biggest, I should say, investment that he's ever made uh, in a single company, including his own. We are his biggest single investment personally, um, but uh, one that uh, he would continue uh, on the board and hold for a very long time because uh, he's, a, he's a true believer. Uh, he walked uh, in our centers um, and um, you know, met with the patients uh, and uh, saw for himself um, and, and of course got uh, all of uh, the uh, references to show uh, what kind of impact that we are having and what we could have by expanding our services throughout the country. All right, last thing for you, Marlo. Talk to us about the, this is like a, two, a two-parter here, the scale-up plans and how you're going to take on the, the obvious competitor in this space that's already a publicly traded company, Oak Street Health. I mean, on paper, you guys look very similar. Similar kind of revenue numbers, similar numbers of, of members, a lot of similarities there. Uh, you guys are, are right now trading at a discount here. <laughs> but I mean, like, so talk about how you guys are going to, I mean, I know this is a huge space, Medicare Advantage, but how are you guys going to differentiate? Are you going to rely on this, you know, this focus that you've had from the beginning of working with the Latino markets? I mean, the markets that you're in now, are you really focusing on that? Or is it going to be something else that differentiates you um, and helps you kind of stand out and maybe outflank uh, Oak Street? Well, uh, the, the first thing uh, that I would say is uh, great company, uh, Oak Street, um, and um, we are uh, a comparable uh, company and they are uh, to us uh, because, yes, we do a lot of the same things and the centers are similarly designed and have some similar services and, and treating a similar demo. Um, but we're not competitors. We're not even in the same markets to give you uh, an idea of the scale and the TAM um, pretty soon is going to be a one trillion plus uh, TAM uh, for managed care, and you put us together, and you don't get you know within half a percentage point of the national market. Um, so um, I think there is so much growth uh, that is available, and what we differentiate uh, versus you know many uh, of our competitors, and there are not many, and that's the issue. Uh, there's a huge scarcity of uh, providers in general and even more scarcity of value-based providers yep. um, is that we have this standardized population health approach uh, with access, wellness, and quality as we discussed during our analyst day. And I would encourage uh, your viewers to uh, take a look at our analyst deck. Oh, I'm but sure they've already got it pulled up. Knowing <laughs> <that>. <laughs> uh, 
and 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 we grow in three uh, distinct ways um, by building our centers, but also buying and integrating and affiliating uh, practices, uh, all depending on the needs of that population. And then we adjust our services using our pop health tools and reflect the population we serve. And you know, you're quite right, uh, underserved, um, there are very few providers in this huge um, demo that so badly needs the service in COVID, uh, disproportionately affected, as we know, but in, in general uh, as well, and it's a major source uh, of social economic uh, inequality. And so we're doing our part uh, in uh, serving uh, the uh, underserved community, which could be minorities, and certainly Latinos are about 69% or so of our patients, 11% uh, are African American, a couple other percent our other minorities, but yes, Caucasian uh, as well. So we have many uh, markets in which we serve in which Caucasians are the main underserved uh, community. And so uh, we're gonna continue to go into those parts of town that has been disproportionately affected and we see it throughout uh, the country um, and be able to deploy uh, this population health platform that individualizes care to that patient, but also is able to provide a sustainable, cost solution that increases quality to the population as a whole. Uh, and, um, you know, we have a, our, our work uh, cut out. Uh, you can see our guidance for 2021. And also because of SPAC land, you can see our 22 and, and 23 numbers, but, you know, sky's, uh, you know, truly the limit because of the huge addressable uh, TAM with the scarcity of uh, providers and it takes years. It, it took us a number of years to really, you know, perfect uh, the secret sauce. And we're learning uh, every day and uh, bolting on, you know, new technologies uh, to Panorama is incredibly exciting. Awesome. Well, Marlo, best of luck to you. Congratulations again on going public via SPAC IPO with JAWS Acquisition Corp. This is super exciting, especially, you know, as we as we talked about a little bit before we started recording, you know, so many years put into building your business. And um, it's it's got to be it's got to feel very rewarding to see this finally achieve the level of success that you've achieved. So congratulations again. Thank you so much for stopping by and introducing us to Cano Health. Um, and yeah, best of luck to you. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. No problem. No problem. And like you guys know, you can find more interviews with those who are leading the change in healthcare. And this one in particular, taking on that Medicare Advantage crowd with a value-based care that we're going to be scaling across the country here soon. I'm Jessica DeMasa. This is What's the Future Health. Find more over on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash WTF Health. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.